Hi, welcome to Letchworth Cable Access. I'm Saul Hauser, and with me today is Nate McMurray, congressional candidate and former town supervisor of Grand Island. Yes, thanks for having me, Saul. I'm glad to be here. So can you tell me a little bit about your journey and what brought you to run for Congress? Yes, uh, last year I decided to run. It's I never thought I'd have a, um, a career in politics or any deep political ambition. I was always interested in my community. I was always interested in making things better. I followed politics. Um, and then I wanted to run against Chris Collins. I thought he was not representing the region. I thought he was hiding. He had serious ethical issues and people were not talking about it. So I thought, well, it may be difficult because he's he was a very wealthy man, or is a very wealthy man, um, and he had a lot of support, but I thought it was the right thing to do. So I ran against him last year. It was one of the closest races in the country. We came within less than half a percentage point. Um, it was the biggest partisan swing for a first time candidate. So uh, I felt really good about what we did. I thought we stood up for something that was important, even though a lot of people um, closed their eyes to who Chris was or what kind of leader he was. I felt that we brought uh, a voice to a lot of people in Western New York. So I'm running again and I'm excited about the opportunity to potentially serve the people of NY27. And so you lost by just over a thousand votes, you said? Yes, it was very close. So one of the questions I had was, how will you win against this year with a candidate with less baggage than Chris Collins had? Well, I think people should, uh, we don't know who we're going to run against. They might have more baggage than Chris Collins. I mean, a lot of these people supported Chris Collins. And I think that was one of the problems we had is there was, there was, it was party over country rather than the other way around. So we even had people that were local media people saying, we know Nate's a better person, but you still have to vote for Chris because he's a Republican. And that was said publicly. Uh, and a lot of the people that want to replace him were either very close to him, worked right beside him, or told you to forget about the stuff that he did wrong. They wanted you to completely ignore it. So I don't know if they'll have less baggage, but I think I definitely have more support than I ever had before. I mean, no one knew who I was. No offense, Saul, you probably didn't know who I was a year ago. Most people didn't know who I was. And we've had a lot of support, and people are very positive about um, the kind of values we represent, which is an inclusivity, which is a fairness, which is a, a chance for everybody in American to, uh, America to have a piece of that American dream. Um, and I think there's a lot of people behind us, and I feel good about our chances. So can you tell me about a time that you kind of saw the impact that your work had on somebody? Well, as a small town leader, I, I saw it a lot, and I really became interested in more and more in politics as the town of Grand Island supervisor. It wasn't easy, um, and I saw often when people would take the easy way and move away from what was right, uh, even on a small level like a town level. But when I was able to stand up for the things that I believed in there, and I saw projects come to life, things that people said could not be done, um, like going to cashless tolling. Uh, there was a time when the governor, Governor Cuomo, said, we're not going to do it. And then we had him come to Grand Island and, and put those cashless tolls in. That was a fight. Um, and it was successful for us. We, we did a lot of conservation projects. We put in um, trails and parks that helped people's life get better. So I believe that when there's good government and people are really involved, not to get a career or a paycheck or a pension, but really in politics for service, you definitely can see good things happen. You just have to have the courage to, to stand up for what you believe in. And speaking of that, um, one of the things that you mentioned in your platform is about dairy farming. And that's one of the important things here in Wyoming County, especially where there are more cows than people. Right, dairy farming right. is pretty much the number one industry. Lately, the last several years, there have been pretty unsustainable milk prices. And that's put a lot of farmers in tough places and put some out of business. Right. How would you be a voice for area farmers? Well, Saul, you nailed it. I mean, the, the thing we need to do for dairy farmers is we, we have to, to make it simple, it comes down to this. It can't cost less to sell milk than it does to produce the milk. And there's a lot of different options before us, but we have to make sure that people who are putting all this effort in are actually getting the return on their investment. And so that probably means higher milk prices in some capacity, and it definitely means that we have to find ways for these farmers to be successful that we haven't looked at yet, whether that's examining quotas or examining 
other types of, of, of opportunities for them, including trade opportunities. Um, it, we have to look at farming differently than we do. The way we need to look at farming is a national security issue. And I, that may sound crazy, but let's think about it. If these farmers in Wyoming County or Orleans County or Ontario County go out of business, where do we get our milk from? Where do we get our milk from or, or our other food from? We get it from overseas. And then what if there's an emergency? So it really is a national security issue, and we have to protect our farmers, not just because it's economically important, but it's important to who we are as a people and also important to our security. So I will, I, I've always been heavily involved in farming as, as, a, as a leader. When I first started as a, as a leader of a small town where I live, it's a quasi agricultural town. It's a quasi-rural town. It's, it's a little bit city, a little bit rural. It's definitely more city than Perry, but more rural than Buffalo. Um, but there's a lot of farmers there. And the town was actually suing the farmers when I started. And I said, why are we doing this? So I worked hard to create an agricultural protection plan, the first of its kind for a town of our size. Um, we started a farmer's market. We, we I ended all the lawsuits against the farmers. People thought there'd be chaos. They thought there'd be pigs and chickens running around the city. And even if there was, nobody cared. I mean, people loved it. And I, it's, it's really enhanced our community. So farming is something I believe in very much. And I will talk to the farmers hand in hand. And I'll say, how can we help you? How can we diversify your offerings? How can we help you uh, find ways to make your, your farms more efficient? How can we find labor? That's something people don't talk about. These farmers need labor. You know, you just said it. There's more cows than people in some of these communities. And how are we going to get the cows to milk themselves? So I will find all sorts of ways to work for the, with the farmers, including finding ways that they can actually make money on dairy. Great. Thank you. No worries. And one of the things you mentioned was that it's a national security issue. Yeah. And so I have another sort of national security issue to talk sure. about which is the recent situation in Iran. On January 3rd, President Trump ordered a strike against General Soleimani, and the killing has really increased tensions between the U.S. and Iran. How would you work to kind of de-stress and to reduce tensions? Well, first, let's talk reality here, everybody, because if you think about where we are today versus to where we were a week ago, it's certainly worse. A week ago, people in Iran were protesting their own government. This week, they're protesting our government. So any of the goals or the perceived goals of the Trump administration are not being fulfilled by this. Number one is, has this made us more safe? Well, clearly it hasn't, because now we're being openly threatened with terrorist attacks, domestic terrorist attacks, cyber attacks. So it hasn't made us more safe. Number two, it hasn't helped us in, in Iraq we, we were just told by the Iraqi legislature that they want us out. It hasn't led to Iran being denuclearized. They're working hard now to start enriching uranium again. So all of the apparent or alleged goals of the Trump administration are not being fulfilled by this. And let's be blunt, I think that it's pretty obvious what the real goal was, to make us stop talking about impeachment. The timing is too strange. I hate to think that the President of the United States would try to change the news cycle by assassinating someone. Now, is this guy a good guy? Uh, definitely not. He's a terrible guy. But if that's the standard for assassination, we're in trouble. Because he's writing letters to Kim Jong-un, love letters. He's saying Putin's a good guy. These are not good guys. So if the standard is bad guy, and we're allowed to kill anybody we think is a bad guy or is a bad guy, we're, this is a, almost a chaotic standard, or it is a chaotic standard. So I don't think this has made us more safe. I'll tell anybody who's listening, I'll look at the camera. If I go to Congress, I will not support any war that I wouldn't send my own family members to. I think we've had enough wars in this country that have wasted money. 17 years in Iraq. 17 years. 17 years, trillions of dollars. We could have literally built a new school in every community in the entire country for the amount of money we wasted on Iraq. And now we're getting kicked out? Anyone who's listening to this or anybody who's paying attention should be very angry. He's not making us more safe. 
neither did the guy before him or the guy before him. We need to stop wasting money on these foreign wars. We need to help the farmers in Wyoming County. Thank you. No problem. And one of the other things that's kind of a worldwide issue is climate. The world's facing an imminent climate emergency, and it's a pretty clear consensus, consensus among climate scientists that climate change caused by human activity is a threat to our planet as a whole, and also to our local communities. The United Nations has said that the world has to cut emissions for 2020 by 7.6%, just in order to keep the rise in global temperatures to 1.5 degrees or lower Celsius by the end of the century. So how do you believe we can take responsibility for our effect on the planet and the environment and be responsible stewards of the world for people for future generations? Saul, do you, let me ask you this. Do you think climate change is real and caused by man? Yes. So do I. Let me say it to everybody who's listening. Because why do I think that? Because I'm not arrogant enough to think that I know more than 99% of the scientists in the, in the world. We can see the results of climate change. The Prime Minister of, the, of Australia said he doesn't believe in climate change. Well, he's changing his tune this week as this country burns. You're younger than me, and I have children. I want a world that is better than the world I inherited. I don't want to give you or the next generation, the generation after, a world that's worse. Now, the, the, the argument is that all of this stuff is some kind of... of, of uh, some kind of ruse that's really designed. Our president said it's a Chinese hoax. It's not. It's an opportunity for us to move into the future by investing in the type of technology that would make us more green or more climate friendly would help our economy. Now there's issues with Tesla. Tesla. I don't think Tesla is the greatest com company in the world. They have issues too. But I read this morning that if the stock price of Tesla continues to go up the value of Tesla will be more than GM and Ford combined. Now, I bring it up because not that long ago, I remember when people said electric cars were a joke, that we could never compete with fossil fuels. If we invest in these technologies, it will not only make the country better or the world better, it will improve our economy. Now, I'm not saying you put solar panels down the middle of Letchworth, of course. Or, or windmills or anything else. There's a time and a place for everything. As, as the Bible says, for every time there is a purpose under heaven. We put these things in the appropriate places. But what we don't do is turn our back on technology, on the future, on science. America was great because we believed in science and reason and logic, not just emotion. And I, I'm afraid we're, we're reaching a stage now where even when the facts are extremely clear, we are turning our back on reason. And it's putting not only our country, but our economy and our future and, and, and our way of life in jeopardy. So yes, when I go to Congress, I'll be looking for ways to invest in technology that helps our economy and also helps our environment. And speaking of the economy, the economy's been growing over the last several years, but many Americans still face healthcare costs they can't afford, rationing medication, and putting off necessary surgeries to preserve their lifestyle, their home, for their retirement. What's your plan to help people who can't afford insurance, medication, or procedures? Medicare for all. Now, you can laugh at that all you want, but I was just talking to a congressman who was a congressman from this area not too long ago. He said 40 years ago, he campaigned on an expansion of Medicare in phases. It wasn't that controversial. It's become vilified by a propaganda machine that wants to make so you don't have access to health care. Or if you do, you pay through the nose for it. Now, I'm a realist. I understand that things cost money. But I'm also smart enough to understand that we pay more for health care in America than any OECD country, and we have the worst outcomes. That's the fact. So we're not, we do not have a good health care system, and we're paying even hundreds of times more for some procedures. If you break your arm and you go to the hospital, say, how much is it going to cost? They're not going to tell you. They're not going to even give you a range. There's no other product that you, you would accept such a standard. So what do I think we should do? I think if you, you, you find me someone who's on Medicare who wants to give it up, there is nobody. So why don't we expand such a program? And we don't do it so we rip your, your insurance away. No, we do it in phases. 
And if you want to have additional insurance, guess what? Go ahead. Pay for that insurance yourself. But if we don't set a basic standard for all Americans, we are not. What's the point? What's the point of wasting all this money on technology that we, most of us don't have access to? And when people say, well, we can't do that in America, well, let me say this. I'm not saying we should have socialization or social, socialism for medical treatment. There's, th there's a couple different ways to go about this. In the UK, which most of us would agree is not a socialist country, it's a capitalist country, that's over here. Now, their system is the government controls every aspect of healthcare, essentially. That's not what I'm advocating for. In Canada, you have a, a single payer system, kind of a Medicare for all system, where you have private providers, but prices of drugs and prices of certain procedures are controlled and regulated by the government, and the government is the payer for these, these different procedures so they can control costs. Most economists believe this is the best version of the system. In America, we have a completely, complete free-for-all system where most people just have to go out there and figure it out on their own. My uh, family member of mine was just sick. I have insurance, pretty good insurance. Minor procedure, went to the, went to the emergency room. $4,000. Now, I can pay that, but I understand that most people cannot. Because, now let's go back to the original part of your question. My view of the world. Now, first, and I don't know if you know my background, Saul, but I was in business my entire adult life. I've been a member of the American Chamber of Commerce overseas. I was vice president of, of large companies working in business development. I'm not some radical. I'm someone who understands business and understands the a pro forma and, and the value of a dollar. I just don't think this system makes any sense and we need to have new ideas about how to make it better. Because what you're talking about is right. You have a, blue, a booming economy, right? A booming economy for who? It's a trickle-down economy that never trickles. It stagnates. So if anybody thinks this economy is working, come with me for a tour of NY27. You have so many people suffering, so many people who do not have a chance and access to a future that my parents and my grandparents took for granted. So yes, my goal is to make this more of an inclusive society, and I think there's ways that we can do that that helps the middle class not the upper class. The well, anyone who's listening to this, let me ask you this. Do you really think it makes sense to have an economy where your boss or a CEO of a corporation makes a thousand times more than the average employee? Because there's companies like that in America today. Do you think it makes sense to say we can't afford health care? You can't afford health care when Amazon made $10 billion last year and didn't pay one dollar in federal taxes. Does that make sense? So yes, I think we need to change the way we look at things and we have to put people first, put the middle class first, and I'm gonna go there and fight for it. Thank you. And one of the things you talked about is more inclusive society. And so I wanted to ask you about actually a New York State law, since two of our candidates were in the New York State Senate. The Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act is a state law that was passed just last year, and it prohibits discrimination based on gender identity or expression. Two of the candidates were presented with the opportunity to vote for it, and neither one voted for it. So if a similar bill came before you in Congress, since there's no similar national protection, how would you vote? i vote for it. And you two gentlemen who didn't vote for it, you should be ashamed of yourself. You're sophisticated people who have friends, you know people who are affected, who would have been protected by this law, and you didn't vote for it because you didn't have the guts to stand up to your party machine. And you know it. Because you know, I know how some of you guys live in your private life, and it's nothing like you pretend to be in public. Let me say this to you. What is wrong with saying you cannot discriminate against somebody because of their, the, the way they identify themselves. What is wrong with that? Aren't we a society that wants to make sure people are not discriminated against? This should be a no-brainer. I'm not, we're, a lot of people that I meet in NY27 are Christians. And we hear, I see those what would Jesus do things all the time. And I grew up a Christian. I believe in the Christian values. What would Jesus do 
He wouldn't discriminate against people because of their identity. And I will be a fierce advocate because it's the right thing to do. It's the American thing to do. And those people didn't have the guts to vote. They should be ashamed of themselves, and that vote will haunt them in the years to come. Because I know darn well that your generation, the generation after, they don't look at this the same way, and they don't have the fear that I was raised with and people older than me were raised with. They have the courage to be caring and inclusive and have empathy for people different than they are. Thank you. Sorry, I'm getting all worked up. I believe in this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I don't try to, listen, I don't try to sugarcoat who I am or what I feel. I, I want you to vote for me. You don't have to agree with everything I say, but I want you to vote for me because of who I am, not of who I pretend to be. I want you to vote for me because of who I am and what I believe, and where we don't agree, let's find common ground and work it out. That's my approach. And if you don't vote for me, so be it. At least I didn't lie to you. Thank you. And... So we're running a little bit short on sure. time now. Sure, sorry so. about that. <laughs> no, that's okay. Yep. We're talking the better. That's what okay. you're here for. <laughs> and so I wanted to ask you, is there anything that we didn't get to that you especially wanted to talk about? <sighs> the biggest thing is, again, if you're di you may have different views than me. You may, have, uh, you, may, you may disagree with some of the things I said today. But when I go to Washington, you'll understand that I will work for you. I am there to listen to what your concerns are and to serve you. Why do I want to do that? <laughs> a lot of this isn't as easy, like driving around and beating people and being in the public eye and being attacked. It's not easy. It's not fun. But I'm doing it because I care about NY27. I care about Western New York. I want my kids to have a future here, and I want your kids to have a future here too. And I think that if, if you, the, the least I can say, if you send me, I will fight for you fiercely the same way you saw me, with the same passion and energy you saw on this show tonight. So I hope you give me the chance, and uh, if you do, I will serve humbly and as, uh, as diligently as I possibly can. Thank you so much. Thank you, Saul. Nice to meet you. And thank you for watching Watch Earth Cable Access tonight.